So could you tell me a little bit about um, the relationship that philosophy has with the notion of happiness and the history of that? It's one of, happiness is one of the oldest subjects in philosophy, uh, at least in in one sense of the word. So the you know, um, so the ancient you know ancient Greeks, Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, uh, they one of their main concerns was a happy life, um, you know, flourishing. So your life going well for you, and that's really what actually ancient ethics in Greece was really all about was what can we do to thrive to flourish to have happy lives and um, and when they talk about happiness they use it in a, in a much richer broader sense than the way we usually use it today um, but so that uh, but they also were concerned with having a pleasant fulfilling life happiness as any as Americans talk about it today so so when the Greeks were talking about happiness in this richer, broader sense, could you define that for us? In a... uh, they generally thought of happiness as a matter of fulfilling your nature, living in a way that allows you to, um, that fits with the kind of being you are. And the most popular theory today from that time is probably Aristotle's. And for Aristotle's, for Aristotle, a uh, happy life is one where you fully realize your capacities, um, you engage in worthwhile, excellent activity, and the standard formula is um, that happiness consists in a life of virtuous activity in accordance with reason. But really, it's it's not being a couch potato. It's yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, living in a way that's admirable and doing things worthwhile. And part of that, though, is that you enjoy it. It's fulfilling. So, um, if we live our life to our full uh, capacity or full of, um, abilities, is that um, was that defined? Was that were, were those capacities defined, or, or are they um, uh, individual individual capacities? Are they individual um, ideas of, of, of self? Because, I mean, I might have a great capacity for. Uh, smashing up cars with sledgehammers, you know, or or um, or, uh, or for you know astrophysics, like a, and a, like. Did the, did the Greeks have a have a sort of uh, a set of rules that that was this sort of archetype or ideal to live a happy life? So most of them, and I want to set aside the Epicureans who thought of a happy life just as pleasure yeah. in, a, in, a, in a sense. Uh, they had a, an objective idea of a good life, and you really, you really fulfilling your nature meant living up to uh, the standards of a, a human being, a good human being. Uh, so, if say you have a very unusual nature or personality, um, then then acting in a way that suits your personality may not actually be what flourishing is. For. Uh, it may actually be a bad life uh, from their point of view. So, uh, so Aristotle uh, and Aristotelian might say that, say, Genghis Khan, uh, I'm told that he, uh, about one in 200 of us are descended from him. Yeah. Um, or someone who was in his neighborhood. And uh, so he had, in some sense, a very successful life, it seems. Uh, and maybe he enjoyed it, but whether or not um, he didn't meet the standards of human excellence as far as Aristotle is concerned. And that's really the biggest difference, I think, with the modern age, where we tend to think of it more as an individual thing. And if you're different and say, uh, a life in society with other people isn't the life that fits your personality, then an Aristotelian would say that you're missing something. So in terms of the evolution of uh, philosophical thinking around happiness, how has it changed since Aristotle, and who? What have been the big markers? Who have been the the loudest voices on that subject? Probably, I, I think when we get to the modern age, you get much more of a focus on. You get much more of a shift to happiness as a state of mind, 
and then actually then the meaning of the word kind of splits and we start using the word just for a state of mind but um, uh, Jeremy Bentham who is one of the first thinkers in utilitarianism so he had this moral theory that uh, at the time was sort of revolutionary he wasn't the first person to say this but he said everything we do should be based on the idea of promoting happiness and reducing misery and whatever and so if ordinary traditional morality comes in conflict with making people happier then we have to throw that out um, so it was kind of a revolutionary idea but for him happiness was just pleasure and freedom from pain uh, and he had a he didn't say a whole lot about what pleasure is supposed to be but it sounded like a very simple theory um, the next biggest name would have been John Stuart Mill who uh, is probably my favorite in this tradition and because he sort of marries, I think, Aristotle and Bentham in a way. But for him, happiness is still pleasure, a, a pleasant life. But he also thinks that a life where we use our higher capacities is actually a better kind of pleasure and is a better life for us. So in that way, he comes a little closer to Aristotle. Um, and, uh, and, and I think that's resonated with a lot of people. And then... I think the next touchstone would be, um, uh, it's really economists who have driven this, I think, is the idea of happiness is getting what you want, um, uh, satisfying your preferences. And that's really the notion of happiness, or they say welfare, or I prefer calling it well-being. Um, but that happiness is just actually getting what you want. And if that makes you happy, that's great. If it doesn't make, I, um, now I, it starts sounding paradoxical. <laughs> if that makes you feel good, that's yeah. great. If it doesn't make you feel good, then um, as long as you're getting what you want. So let's say uh, an artist who actually is happy to sacrifice, is willing, wants to sacrifice uh, some pleasure in their life in order to accomplish things that they see as worthwhile on a desire theory, um, then they can still do well because they're getting what they really care about, even if they don't feel that great. Yeah, yeah. And um, so for you personally, um, who were the guys that motivated you to get into this particular field? Uh, was it, uh, Is that how it happened? Or did you read something when you were studying that was particularly um, uh, inspiring? To you, or, or or how did how did it come about? How did your special how did your specialising in this field come about? Uh, for me, it was reading in graduate school, uh, reading uh, work by psychologists in this area, and I first came across in the early '90s when the field was really pretty new. It really, if there's a formal start date, and there really isn't one, but maybe when Ed Diener wrote a paper in 1984 pushing the idea of subjective well-being and, and measuring happiness in that sense of the term. And I got really interested in what the psychologists were doing. So we're getting all these studies telling us things like most people are happy or and, and what causes happiness or unhappiness. And then other studies by people, um, uh, uh, Danny Kahneman and others, who argued that uh, actually these the kind of measures that people are using have real problems because it seems like it's easy to get people to change their answers to the, the question. So on a nice sunny day like this, um, people might say that they're happier than if it were cloudier, uh, even though they're just they're talking about their general condition or their life as a whole. So that's what really got me interested is figuring out, well, what are they, are, are they, what, What's the importance of this? Are they talking about happiness as the rest of us know it? Um, and what is happiness in the first place? Um, and because a lot of philosophers are saying, well, this, that's not really happiness that they're talking about. And, uh, and then and there's just so many questions that came up, you know, thing, and, and things about, well, is this the right way to measure happiness and things like that. And I, I found the literature fascinating. So it was really psychologists that got me interested in that. Um, there were not many philosophers at the time working in this area. So I'll jump straight off from there to what is happiness? <laughs> <laughs> 
so from my perspective I I don't think that I think there's more than one legitimate answer you could give. I don't. I, I think uh, nobody really owns the word, and we use the word for different things. And when I survey my students, I find that they use it for different things, depending on it's very easy to get them to shift the way they use the word. I th I think the most useful way to use to understand it that makes the most sense of why a parent says I, I want my children to be happy is to think of it as uh, what we sometimes call emotional well-being um, and as basically like the opposite of anxiety and depression and that's oversimplifying but it's it's so it's an emotional matter basically um, and uh, and I and I but and it's much richer than that but it's um, so it's not just feelings of sensations of pleasure it's much more of an emotional thing that has um, uh, sometimes, if I'm impressed, I might call it psychic affirmation or even psychic flourishing to be happy. Because uh, I, I think the way we use words like emotion and mood have these very narrow connotations that aren't very helpful and make it sound shallow. So that's, I think, the most useful way to think about it. And this is where we're just talking about as a state of mind. Um, I don't think, I think actually in er, for what Aristotle was talking about, emotional well-being is one part of um, a happy life in that broader sense of the term. Uh, but I think it's an important part. And I think in most of, um, probably most of the people you're talking to, psychologists and, 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 um, and self-help authors and so forth, probably are thinking of it just as a, as a state of mind. And I think that's great because that's, it's a really important state of mind. It's 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 not everything, but it's it's very important. Um, there are two other ways that a lot of researchers understand it, and and th these are respectable views also. Um, some just identify happiness with pleasure, and so uh, uh, sexual pleasure for me is probably the most interesting case where. It can feel really good, but emotionally, it's not always that fulfilling. Uh, and so, in the emotional well-being sense, pleasure may not always do, do that much for you. Um, the other, but the most popular view that you'll see in the scientific literature is uh, the idea of happiness as life satisfaction, and that's much more a matter of judgments than feeling. So it's. So you ask somebody, taking all things together, how satisfied would you say you are with your life as a whole? And that's a very appealing view in a lot of ways, I, but I think it has a lot of problems to think of happiness that way. Um, so I, 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 I think life satisfaction is something that's important to study, but uh, it's not helpful to think of it as happiness in the sense that I don't think it's what we want when we want our kids to be happy. I think uh, pleasure is one of the most important things for well-being, for a happy life or flourishing. Um, imagine that you could plug into a machine that could give you any experience you want. It could give you any state of mind that you want, and you won't know that it's a sham. So you could plug into the matrix, say, and it could give you, you could think uh, you are... George Clooney or, uh, or Einstein or whatever you want and, uh, and experience that life, but none of it's real. It's just an illusion. So you feel good. You have whatever mental states you want, but it's not grounded in reality. Would that be the kind of life you want to be in that machine? Uh, some people say yes, but most people say they would not want to plug into that kind of machine um, I think that uh, speaks to people's life experience I think um, if, if you know I think people in extreme hardship would say plug me in plug me in right now and people who, who, who um, whose lives are quite comfortable um, can afford the luxury of um, fetishizing authenticity maybe and uh -huh. so and so maybe that's why they would not and that is, if you ask different versions of it, yeah. um, you can get different answers. So um, we have to be careful. I think it's never a good philosophy to rest everything on one example like that. Um, 
that is interesting. A friend of mine did a study which you'll never see published because university review boards won't allow it. Um, okay. Because he studied uh, uh, inmates in a maximum security prison in Alabama. And actually, uh, almost all of them said they preferred the reality of their lives in prison to be to plug into an experience machine. That's surprising. Uh, it was, it's very surprising. Um, <laughs> yeah. And but I, I at the same time, um, maybe it's that their lives weren't as bad as you might expect. I yeah. don't know what was behind that. Yeah. Um, but I think some conditions might be worse than being in some realities may be worse than being an experience machine even if the example is correct yeah i'd be plugged in and then be, there are a lot of people yeah, yeah. who say that so yeah. it's it's not um so it's a, a, a it's it's one of the data points we use when we think about these things but not everybody finds that they wouldn't want to plug i in. think if we i mean because if, if we're experiencing it as as though it's reality then it's reality isn't it uh -huh. i mean you know i, I, I it, it, for me, it just seems that obvious that that, that would be the... I th one of the things, uh, so I, when I uh, surveyed my students on this, uh, I gave them a slightly different example of somebody who um, is satisfied with his life, he enjoys it, he leads a blissful life until he dies, uh, but he never realizes that his wife and children hate him behind his back. Um, so he's, and he'd be devastated if he knew. So then I asked my students, well, was he happy? Almost all my students say he was happy. Um, a majority say he didn't have a happy life. So then they're channeling, I think, this broader idea of happiness. And also didn't think he was fortunate, didn't think it was an enviable condition or that his life went well. But not everybody said that. Mm -hmm. And so people are divided on this about whether really all that matters is your experience. Uh, and I think there's good reason. I, I uh, My own view is kind of with the majority of philosophers in thinking that experience isn't all that matters. Happiness is really important, but um, I don't think, and this is controversial, but I don't think one has to be happy to have a good life. And in fact, and I, I actually think how you handle what life throws at you is much more important. And 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 for me, uh, it's useful to think of what you might call a eulogy test. Imagine, you know, somebody has died, and you're giving the eulogy, but say it's to an empty room. You don't have to worry about being polite and say whatever you think. Did they have a good life? Um, hey, most people I know aren't happy, but I think most people I know at least that I'm willing to hang out with, <laughs> have good lives, as I think they're, they're good people and they, and, and they lead worthwhile lives. And I think that doing things that are worthwhile, uh, and um, that that's more important, I think, than being happy, as important as happiness is. Um, I, 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 I get bothered by common claims that say happiness is a choice. Um, uh, now, I have a good friend who's a Buddhist monk, and he's very good at, at this, but he spent many years training intensely, and, uh, and if you're not willing to put in that training, and I, and, and I don't know how much of it is he was also lucky, I just don't know, but, um, if, uh, but I think just treating happiness as a choice like choosing what shoes to wear I think trivializes the difficulties of it. Because so much of it is our habits, our skills, and um, and our the environment we're in. Clinical depression is not something you just choose not to have. To what extent do you think environment affects happiness? My own experience is it's one of the most important variables you can that many people can control. Um, but um, I think being in the right kind of culture, the right kind of community, with the right kind of friends, and um, because also it's not just that we get pleasure out of companionship, but other people 
affect our state of mind in, in kind of like a contagion. Uh, and, and there's this great research on social contagion where all sorts of things spread through social networks. And a lot of it is just automatic. Um, and you find things like when people move to different cultures, um, that all sorts of their personalities change. And, uh, and that was for me, um, I spent, I, I was sort of like a bicultural growing up, living, shifting between different cultures. And my personality was just very different in the different places. And in one place, happiness was hard, and the other place, happiness was easy. Um, so I think it's, it's one of the most underappreciated things, I think, is the importance of the social and physical context we're in, the environment that we're in for happiness. I absolutely agree. Uh, what do you, what um, part then do you think ge genetics plays in uh, in a person's happiness? I think it plays a very important role because I, I and I think uh, in, especially in setting your temperament uh, and even with a, a young child, you can often kind of get a sense of at least where the odds are between two children of who's more likely to be happy. Um, and or who's going to have an easier time being happy? Um, uh, but I don't think that the genes are destiny by any stretch of the imagination. And I think a lot of the research has exaggerated the importance of genes because the way they tend to look at it is, say, you take two twins who've been separated at birth, and you see how happy they each are, and you find well, it looks like the environment doesn't make a big difference. So genes must be explaining why um, their happiness is kind of similar. But you, you never see twins separated at birth and one is raised among the Maasai in Kenya and the other one's in Beverly Hills. Uh, so um, the environments that they're studying are pretty similar. It tends to be middle class, suburban homes, things like that. And uh, all pretty much in the same social context uh, by and large so um, so it's hard to really estimate the role of genes in happiness um, I think it's it is quite important but it, it's um, I, I, I don't think it's I mean it, it's also seems like genes are important in um, affecting people's political views um, so political views are highly heritable in these gene studies uh, but it doesn't mean that we can't improve our political views and we can be happy um, I guess um, my, in my uh, very limited understanding philosophy does a, a, um, a great job of deconstructing what happiness is uh, are there many philosophers who sort of stake a claim and say this is how you become happy this is, these, are, these are steps uh, to a more fulfilled uh, um, life. Ancient philosophers did that a lot, especially the Stoics and Epicureans, yeah. and, and the, the Stoics were very influential, like in the Roman Empire. Um, you know, the, one of the emperors, Marcus Aurelius, was a Stoic philosopher. Uh, and they really focused, if you read uh, one of the classic Stoic texts um, uh, uh, by Epictetus, it's practical prescriptions. Uh, about what to do to become, to have a happier life. So they were very focused on, um, on giving practical advice. Most of the ancient advice tended to be on how to manage your desires, essentially, and manage your passions and your inner states. Um, but philosophers today, we tend not to do very much of that. Um, uh, some might say that academic philosophers today might be about the last people one should ask for practical <laughs> advice on anything. <laughs> the, uh, but uh, I, it's something I've started thinking about a little bit because, um, just because of the nature of the work I'm doing, and I'm getting interested in policy applications. But, um, but it's it's. Uh, we're generally, it's, it's not our main competence, and we generally try to avoid that. Why do you think that is, that um, philosophies become less prescriptive? 
Some of it I think is uh, we're more specialized in the academy, just we work each on our own, you know, examining our small part of the elephant um, rather than the, the big picture. So, um, I think part of it is in especially uh, English speaking philosophy tends to take science as its model and tends to revalue technical achievement uh, and cleverness more than practical application. And to be honest, when I started doing my work, I uh, really went out of my way to emphasize what I was doing as theoretical, not practical. Um, <laughs> but honestly, I always had practical issues in mind. Yeah. Um, so I think there's a lot of it is, is cultural. Um, it is also hard um, as a philosopher, I like to be able to have an argument, give reasons to back up what I say. And a lot of the homespun wisdom of what works, um, and I actually ventured into this in my last book a little bit toward the end, and I really had to emphasize, I'm, not, I'm, I'm now not speaking as an expert, just as somebody who spent a lot of time thinking about it. I'm no more of an expert on leading a happy life than you are. Um, you have your own experiences, but this here are some things that strike me as important things to focus on. Uh, but I feel like to do that, I have to take off my hat as an expert. Yeah, well, that's that's a kind of weird position to be in, right? Like you say, there's, there's maybe three guys doing what you're doing in the world. And, uh, and um, uh, do you consider yourself a happy person? You'd have to ask my wife to get the most reliable answer. Um, uh, I generally think we're not the best judges of our own happiness. A lot of it is, because uh, uh, I think a lot of it is kind of deep, de a lot of deep, kind of unconscious stuff going on. Um, as if I had to guess, I would say I'm, I'm pretty happy at this stage. Uh, I certainly feel like, given the realistic options, um, for uh, uh, the kind of society we live in, um, I'm feeling uh, like I things have worked quite well, and that I'm in a very good spot, and uh, and I, I enjoy life a lot. Um, when I started doing this, one of the things that inspired me to go into this uh, to actually drop the uh, the more marketable research I was working on and do happiness was uh, I went body surfing out <laughs> on the East Coast and I immediately uh, just realized how not happy I had been um, and just without that con because it just switched me right back into a state of mind that was what I spent a lot of my youth in because I spent a lot of my childhood was on the ocean and I'd forgotten what it was like to be in that state of mind. Um, so there's kind of a boiled frog syndrome where it's very hard to judge your own happiness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, without having a contrast. Yeah. Um, I, you said that you sort of uh, you feel um, lucky to be in the position that you're in, given the society that we're living. Uh, a lot of people that we've spoken to have, uh, have uh, spoken about um, gratitude for um, the positive things in your life being um, very a very valuable uh, tool when it comes to kind of accessing happiness. Would you say that that's the case? I think it's one of the things... In general, I actually don't do many of the things that you read about in positive psychology yeah, yeah, books. Yeah. I mean, I benefited a great deal from studying this. Yeah, yeah. But, um, uh, and I don't do gratitude exercise, I don't write stuff down. Uh, and you, I, I think usually people start that and then they stop eventually. But I think I have internalized a greater tendency to focus more on what I'm grateful for and, and, and the good things in my life. I think that's quite healthy and helpful. Um, and uh, so I, I do think gratitude, and, and that's something without any gimmicks or anything anyone can do yeah, yeah. not too much difficulty yeah I think um, you know there is a lot of I, I, I struggle with the with the kind of um, 
I mean, that makes sense that being grateful for your environment just seems to make logical sense to me that that would improve your life and improve your well-being if you can remember that you know you're in a pretty good spot and uh, and you can remember you know you can remind yourself occasionally that sounds great i think that you know i struggle with the accoutrements that come around that in terms of positive psychology you know uh-huh. um, but yeah i guess uh, um so yeah normally i would have ended on those uh, what's more important questions but i guess i'll end uh, with you um with this because i, I you know, yeah, being yeah, being in the position that you're in as a as a as an expert. Um, if somebody, are people intimidated by your knowledge around this, or do people come to you for advice, or how how what's the what's the perception socially of uh, of your role in in, in kind of um, being one of the leading lights around? happiness and well-being um i don't think intimidated um (laughs) i do feel like i mean i I feel like um i'm very grateful for actually feeling like my work has had an impact and people paid attention and um it's it's been really nice i i still find it amazing that anybody ever reads anything i write so um that a number of people have read things i've written is, is is gratifying um, there's, I think people don't really know what to make of it. Yeah, I, I'm a, and, and sometimes I just want to mess with them. What do you do? Like, I'm a happiness researcher. Um, and, uh, and that actually is, tends to lead to better conversations than saying I'm a philosopher. But, uh, and yet, um, I don't get that. Yeah, it's. Uh, I, I think maybe people realize that as an academic, I might not. That doesn't make me a great person to go to for advice, uh, in itself. And uh, uh, I think there is also. Um, I think there are a lot of people who, especially in academics, there's just a certain amount of skepticism, because when they hear the word happiness, they think. You're just talking about rainbows and butterflies and unicorns, and um, and I, that's one of the things that made me, you know, especially at Rutgers, we were supposed to do macho, you know, technical stuff that's just, you know, uh, heavy lifting stuff. And happiness is heavy lifting, but it just doesn't sound like it. And to me, happiness, uh, people think happiness is about, you're just talking about an ideal state, a perfect bliss. And then they, they'll say, well, that's fleeting, so why worry about it? Uh, to me, it's much more interesting to think of happiness as a barometer of a, a, a dimension where our lives can go better or worse, and something we can do better on. I think worrying a lot about being happy is sort of like worrying about being rich. Uh, it's, it's nice, but... And maybe you want to do better, but... To actually get the brass ring, is that what's essential, or is it just doing the best you can given the other things that you have to deal with?